Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary. Would everyone please stand for opening prayer this morning? Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beautiful sunshine today, the warmer temperatures, and Lord, most of all, that we could freely gather together and just to worship you and to hear from you. Father, as we look at the resurrection this morning and just what a wonderful, wonderful story it is. May we treasure it, Lord. May we understand what it means to each of us. And Lord, as we come before you now to worship you, our hearts and minds may be other places as our lives are so busy, but as we worship, Lord, may our hearts and minds be focused upon you so we could receive from you. We thank you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. Today we read from Psalm 132, 132. The eternal dwelling of God in Zion. Verse 1. Lord, remember David and all of his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the Mighty One of Jacob. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not sleep, give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard of it in Ephrata. We found it in the fields of the woods. Let us go into his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, for your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priest be clothed with righteousness and let your saints shout, shout for joy. For your servant, David's sake, do not turn away from the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth to David. He will not turn from it. He will set your throne, the fruit of your body. If your sons will keep my covenant and my testimony, which I shall teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne forever. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place, This is my resting place forever. Here I dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish. This morning, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20 as we're continuing our in-depth study of the Gospel of John. And in our last study, we focused on an overview of the events that happened on this resurrection morning. And the reason that we did that was because the Gospels together paint for us a picture of what took place. It each gives us a little bit different perspective or information about what happened that day. Some like to say it's a contradiction. It's not a contradiction uh, between the Gospels. It's just different information. You know, it'd be like two reporters covering a football game, each covering their own team. You get a different perspective, different information, depending on what the reporter wanted to focus on. And, you know, that's really what we see here in the Gospels. Now, this morning, we're going to focus on what John has told us about this day and how important it truly is. You know, There's no doubt the death of Jesus, dying on the cross of Calvary, paying for uh, the debt of our sins was so important. But many say that that, you know, is the beginning and the ending of the story, and that's not true. It's the beginning of the story. The ending, really, is the resurrection of Jesus. It's that important. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 4, said, For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Both the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are so important. But why? Well, Matthew Henry said this. He said, All who believe in Christ have hope in him. All who believe in him as Redeemer hope for redemption and salvation by him. But if there is no resurrection, their hope in him must be limited to this life. And if all their hopes in Christ lie within the compass of this life, 
they are in a more, much worse condition than the rest of humanity, especially at the time and under those conditions in which the apostles wrote. For then they were hated and persecuted by all people. Preachers and believers, therefore, have a hard lot of, of lot in this life only if they have hope in Christ. Better to be anything than a Christian under these terms. It is a gross absurdity in a Christian to admit the supposition of no resurrection or future state. It would leave no hope beyond this world and would frequently make his condition the worst in the world. Indeed, the Christian is by his religion crucified to this world and taught to live upon the hope of another. Carnal pleasures are tasteless to him in a great degree, and spiritual and heavenly pleasures are those which he pants after. How sad is his case indeed if he must be dead to worldly pleasures and never hope for any better. The wonderful thing is that Christ has risen from the grave. I've called our study, I think appropriately, the tomb is empty. You know, I told you before when Julie and I were in Israel, on the garden tomb, there's a, there's a sign on the tomb. It says he's not here for he is risen. So before you go in, there's the sign. And again, what does every single person do? They believe. <laughs> it's just funny. But that's just human nature. We look. He is not there. He is risen. That's the reality. Now, what proof do we have that Jesus even rose from the grave? And we dealt with this last time in our overview, so I'm not going to go in death. But here's the thing. If he didn't rise from the dead, then the Christian faith is just foolishness. It's a fantasy. If the resurrection of Christ did occur, it confirms that his life, message, and atoning work are real. It's the basis of our hope of life beyond the grave. Think about that. That's what we just talked about. If this is all there is and we die and that's it, there's no resurrection, what's the point? You might as well, you know, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die and it's all over. But that's not the story. Christ is alive and the evidence is overwhelming. And these are the reasons, some of the reasons we could be sure, so sure. And you could look on our webpage, you could look at my notes because I have all the um, scripture references here. I'm not going to go over them because it'd be overwhelming. But Jesus predicted his resurrection. The Old Testament prophesied it. The tomb was empty and the grave clo closed vacant. If those who opposed Christ wished to silence his disciples, all they had to do was produce a body, but they couldn't. Many people saw the resurrected Christ. They looked on his face, touched him, heard his voice, saw him eat. The lives of the disciples were revolutionized. Though they fled and even denied Christ at the time of his arrest, they later feared no one in their proclamation of the risen Christ. The resurrection was the central message of the early church, and the church grew with an unwavering conviction that Christ had risen and was the Lord of the church. And men and women today testify that the power of the risen Christ has transformed their lives. You know, we know that. He is alive. Not just because the historical and biblical evidence is there, but look at what he has done in our lives. Look at the transformation. And I, I understand there are many that have a hard time with this, that Jesus physically rose from the grave. You know, Thomas Jefferson was a great man, but he could not accept the miracle, miraculous elements in the Bible. In fact, he edited his own special version of the Bible in which all references to the supernatural were deleted. And Jefferson, Jefferson, in editing the Gospels, confined himself solely to the moral teachings of Jesus. These are the closing words of Jefferson's Bible. I have a copy of this at home, and I looked at this. So this is the closing words. There they laid Jesus and rolled a great stone at the mouth of the sepulcher and departed. Well, there is a happy ending. I mean, what hope do you have? He's in the grave. He's dead. They crucified him. There's no hope. Why did he do that? Because he doesn't believe in miracles. But isn't that the whole point of miracles? They're impossible. Only God can do that. But what a sad place to be here, not believing in the resurrection. And then our faith is empty. But we have hope, not because of what Thomas Jefferson wrote, but because of what God wrote in his scriptures. But now Christ is risen from the dead, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. 
and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. When you look at the evidence for the resurrection, there is no doubt he's risen. We talked about this before with Dr. Simon Greenleaf. He's Harvard University professor, very verbal skeptic of Christianity. He wrote a book that's still in use today, The Laws of Legal Evidence. And he was challenged by his students one day to apply these books to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think that's amazing. Why they decided this, I don't know, but they decided, put the resurrection on trial. And he accepted the offering. You know what? He became a Christian because he looked at the evidence of what the scripture said. And his conclusion was this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is one of the best established events of history. According to the laws of legal evidence administered in the courts of justice. In other words, if you put the resurrection of Jesus Christ on trial, without a doubt, it's overwhelming he is risen. That's a law professor who started out not believing. And that's his conclusion. Also, many years ago, English trial lawyer and critic of Christianity named Frank Morrison was starting out to write a book disproving the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, after he studied it in depth, he was compelled by the evidence and he became a Christian. And he ended up writing a book in defense of the resurrection entitled, Who Moved the Stone? So the evidence is there. It's just whether people want to believe it or not. That's the real reality. The evidence is overwhelming. And like I said, I've called our study, The Tomb is Empty, and I've broken the verses we're going to be looking at into these main points, and they're in your bulletin. Who moved the stone in John 20, verse 1? Peter and John run to the tomb in John 20, verses 2 through 10. The mercy seat, John 20, verses 11 and 12. My sheep hear my voice, John 20, verses 13 through 17. And go and tell in John 20, verse 18. So let's begin reading John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. And let's see what the Lord has for us this morning as we study his word and look at this message, the tomb is empty. John wrote, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So very early Sunday morning, before the sun had risen, Mary Magdalene, the one whom Jesus delivered from seven demons, comes to the tomb. And why was Mary and the other woman will be coming as well, going to the tomb? Because they came to finish the work that Josephus and Nicodemus started to do. What work did they need to finish? They need to finish the body for, um, with, put spices um, on it. We know Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus took the body of Jesus from the cross at Calvary. They took it to the tomb and they did put burial spices and linen cloth around him, um, but they didn't finish it because it was getting late in the day. And it was going to be the high Sabbath was going to begin, the feast of uh, unleavened bread was going to start, and so they did the best they could and had to leave. Now, did they get the 100 pounds of burial spices on Jesus? We don't know for sure, or the women brought up more spices. Whatever the case, they're coming to finish the work that uh, Joseph and Nicodemus had begun. And again, we saw this when we looked at John 19, chapter 19, verses 39 through 42. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. So again, they did this as quickly as possible. And again, I don't know if they finished, you know, with the 100 pounds there. They may have left some of it. And when Mary and the other woman came, they were going to finish the work. I tend to lean that they put as much as they could on there, and probably all of it. And the women were bringing other uh, burial spices for uh, the body of Jesus. Now, when they were done, they rolled the stone over the doorway to the tomb. And... After this, the Roman soldiers put a seal on the door, stood guard over the tomb so no one could steal the body of Jesus. And so here's Mary Magdalene. She got to the tomb before the sun came up. She wanted to get there as fast as she could. 
And they were worried about one thing. What was the one thing that they were worried about? Well, Mark tells us in Mark 16, 3, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? It's interesting, they weren't worried about the Roman soldiers. Maybe they thought that they would be nice and, you know, let them in. But who's going to roll the stone away? It was a big deal. It weighed anywhere to three to 4,000 uh, pounds. And it was placed in a channel so it could be rolled more easily. But usually the channel had a slight slant into it. So this rock would cover the door and it wouldn't roll away the other way, open it. So they had to roll this stone up this little incline and they weren't able to do it. So who was going to do it for them? Now, what's interesting is before they even get there, before Mary gets there, there's this great earthquake. This angel picked up a stone and moved it to another location. It wasn't just rolled in this channel. It was completely placed in another location. How do I know that? Because what John said, the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And John uses the Greek word eero regarding the stone being moved or taken away. And it means to pick up and carry. Think about that. You're a Roman soldier. The earth's moving under your feet. And you look at the tomb that you're guarding. And here's this angel lifting 3,000, 4,000 pound rock and moving it to another location. Is that going to freak you out? Yeah, absolutely, it would freak me out. That's why they ran. We're like, we're out of here. Exit stage left, right? And so they're gone. So now the stones rolled away and the guards are gone when Mary gets there. So they didn't have to worry about the stone or even getting past the Roman guards. And I don't know what Mary was thinking when she got there. You know, there's no guards on the tomb. And then she sees the stone rolled away. And who moved the stone? Well, an angel of the Lord. She knew something happened, but she didn't know what. She's thinking someone stole the body of Jesus, right? I mean, what other explanation is there? But as we read on, we're going to see Peter and John run to the tomb now. Look at verse 2. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Now, Mary looks into this tomb, and the body's gone. The body of Jesus is gone. And so, obviously, her conclusion is someone stole the body. What else could you say? And she runs to tell the disciples what happened. She runs into Peter and John, and she says, Look, they've taken the Lord away out of the tomb, and we don't know where they laid him. So what do they do? They run. And they're running together. And I like John. You know, I'm a competitive guy. John was a competitive guy. He didn't have to say this, but he goes, I beat Peter. Now, Peter may have been a little older. I don't know. But they started out together, and John goes, I ran. A, I got there first. I can't wait to talk to Peter about that. How did you feel about that, Peter? I don't know. But here's the thing. As John looks in, he sees the grave cloths laying there, but there's no body in them anymore. It's kind of like Jesus just rose out of the grave cloths. Well, it's not it. As if he did. That's exactly what happened. The body of Jesus rose up from those grave cloths. It's not like someone threw them off, unwrapped them. It was like an empty shell. But John, it's interesting, he doesn't go into the tomb at first. Maybe he didn't want to defile himself, 
Peter, he comes in, you know, John's waiting there. Gotcha, Peter. And Peter just runs right in. And he doesn't stop. You know, Peter, he just forges ahead, not thinking about anything. He goes right in. And he, too, sees a grave cloth like an empty shell. And that would make sense. You know, remember, this shell is a mixture of cloth and these spices. So it would be like an empty shell just sit, laying there. You know, Barclay put it like this. He said, the whole point of the description is that the grave cloths did not look as if they had been put off or taken off. They were lying there in their regular folds as if the body of Jesus had simply evaporated out of them. So again, they didn't steal the body of Jesus. No one did. If someone stole the body, do you think they would unwrap those grave cloths? That would take too much time. And even if they did, they'd be all over the place. So there's no way. So as John arrives first, he saw, and the Greek word is blipe in the Greek, and it speaks of seeing visibly, looking in. You know how you first do it? You just kind of look in. That's what he was doing. Peter ran, and he saw these things, therio in the Greek, and it speaks of studying carefully. He's kind of bewildered. It's, we get our English word theory from it. So Peter's trying to figure out what's happened here. What conclusions should I come to here? And then John he couldn't stay out there any longer, entered the tomb, and he saw these things, idean in the Greek, and it basically means, I get it. We get our English word idea from it. John believed something took place. He believed, I don't think to the extent he did when he saw the risen Lord, but he believed something's happened here. He's not sure exactly how to put this all together, but he knows something happened. So Mary, John, Peter all looked in and saw the empty tomb the evidence for his resurrection. And as you look at these three, you can see how people look at the resurrection today. It's kind of interesting. When Mary got there and looked in, she saw that not only was the stone rolled away, but the body was gone. And again, the Greek word for what the, is used for Mary is bleepo, kind of a superficial look, not understanding really what took place. The body's missing and she's coming to some conclusions, but yeah, not completely understanding. And think about it. there are those who have heard about the resurrection of Jesus, but more of a superficial understanding. You know, maybe some saw a commercial around Easter time, or maybe went to VBS when they were young, or some other way they heard about the resurrection. And, you know, you talk to people today about the resurrection, they heard something about it, but they don't know what it means. And then Peter, he ran into the tomb, he looked and saw Therio is the Greek word. He tried to come to some confu conclusions, but he was confused. And I, you know, I, there are a lot of people who have studied about the resurrection of Jesus. They have even written books or papers on the subject, but they don't get it. They have their theories or ideas on how the tomb could be empty, but when you look at them, they're foolishness. The truth is, before them, they refuse to believe. Now, I was just reading a, a, a post I had gotten on my phone about um, this article about the crossing of the Red Sea. Oh, this is interesting, because we're in that section in Exodus on Thursdays. I, I'll, I'll read it, because I thought it was a Christian article. Oh my gosh, it was the worst thing I ever read. There was never, ever a crossing of the Red Sea. It was probably the Sea of Reeds. The Red Sea is never mentioned. It was put in there at a later date. Oh, 600,000 Jews, leave, men, leaving Egypt plus women and children, two to three million people. Are you kidding me? Do you know how long it would take them to cross the, the Red Sea? Well, maybe a day, but you know, you read the story, what did God do? God put a cloud in front to keep the Egyptians in the dark, and he brought light for the children of Israel to cross through the Red Sea. Why? Because they probably crossed at night as well. It took them to get two or three million people some time. And God was holding the Egyptians up. And I, I thought, you know, all the evidence is there. But you just are denying it. And that's what people do with the resurrection. They have their ideas. Oh, they stole the body. Oh, hallucinations. Oh, this, oh, that. No. And then John, who initially saw the evidence of, for the resurrection superficially, he didn't comprehend it. But then when he went in and gave a closer look, he came to understand to believe. I get it. 
You know, that's what it says in verse 8 here of John 20. The other disciple, who's John, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. I don't know about you, but how many times have we heard the resurrection story before we believed? You know, I grew up in the Roman Catholic Church. I heard the resurrection story at least once a year, <laughs> probably once a year. But I didn't believe. I, I had no clue what this was all about until I came to saving faith. And Peter and Mary, yeah, they're going to come to believe as Jesus comes before them. But here now, they look in, and Peter and John are going back home. I don't know. Mary couldn't leave. She's still there at the tomb. And there is a picture that God paints for us here that I am I'm always amazed. I don't know why, because he's God and, you know, God is amazing, but I don't want to lose that amazement as I read the scriptures. I want to go, wow, that is the most awesome thing. And I hope you do too. And the picture that God's painting for us here as we read on is the mercy seat. And I realize that may be confusing, but let me show you what I mean. Look at verse 11 here in John chapter 20. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Notice how John starts out here, but Mary. I love that. The love and devotion that this woman had for her Lord, for Jesus. And here she is. She's alone in, in the tomb. But she had been forgiven so much. She loved that much, too. And here are two angels. One was at the head of where Jesus' head was at. One was at the feet. And again, this is a picture of a, the mercy seat with an angel on either side of this mercy seat. All you have to do is look at that picture right there of the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat. And what do you see on the top of it? Two angels on either side. Isn't that interesting? What does it all mean, though? Well, let me talk a little bit about the mercy seat, and then I'll show you. In Exodus, we read of the tabernacle, of that portable worship center for the children of Israel. And again, I'm not going to go through the whole tabernacle. We're going to do that on Thursdays as we're going through Exodus, but what I want to focus on is the Holy of Holies or the place in the tabernacle where God dwelt. And as you move from the holy place to the Holy of Holies, you pass through this veil uh, or this curtain, and this is what separated man from God. Only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies and only one time a year on the Day of Atonement after he made all these sacrifices for himself he would go in and place the blood on the mercy seat for him and then blood on the mercy seat for the nation of Israel. We call it the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. And in this Holy of Holies, this Ark of the Covenant, it's a small rectangular box, three feet uh, by nine inches long, two feet by three inches wide, and two feet by three inches high, made of acacia wood, covered in gold, inside and out. And inside the Ark of the Covenant was the law of those two tablets of stone that had the law written by the finger of God. And on top of that Ark was the cover, or what we call the mercy seat. Again, it measured two feet three inches long by two feet three inches wide. It's interesting, no dimensions given for its depth. Why? We know how long it, it was and how wide it was, but what about the depth? Well, Maybe because of what we're told in Psalm 103.11. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. It's never ending. His mercy towards us doesn't end. You can't put a dimension to it. The length and width of the mercy seat is the same, though, as the Ark of the Covenant. And that tells me that there are strict limitations that God has set for us to be saved. Salvation is was not going to be based upon good works, on believing this or believing that. It's solely based upon the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and receiving that gift by faith. 
Romans 6.23, Paul said, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. A free gift. Jesus said, John 14.6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. You know how important that is. One writer said, it's, It is all very well to say there is a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. But it's much better to understand clearly what is signified by the words, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof. God's mercy is indeed wide enough to take in every sinner who contritely presents himself at the appointed mercy seat, but it extends no further than that. The limits are divinely established and, on, and are unalterable. Absolutely. God's mercy can't be measured but it can be obtained through Jesus Christ, but it has limits. Now, let me read from Exodus chapter 25, verses 18 through 22 about the ark. It says, And you shall make two cherubim of gold, of hammered work. You shall make them at the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub at one end and the other cherub at the other end. You shall make the cherubim at the two ends of it of one piece with the mercy seat. And the cherubim shall stretch out their wings above, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and they shall face one another. The faces of the cherubim shall be toward the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony that I will give you, and there I will meet with you, and I will speak with you from above the mercy seat. From between the two cherubim which are on the ark of the testimony, about everything which I will give you in commandment to the children of Israel. So God dwells above the mercy seat between the cherubim. And again, on the day of atonement, the high priest would enter in, place the blood upon that mercy seat. In fact, Leviticus 16.4, he shall take some of the blood of the bull, Sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side, and before the mercy seat he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. And again, I've told you this before, there were no seats in the Holy of Holies or the holy place. Why? Because the work for the priest was never done. The sacrifices of these animals could never take away your sins. They only covered them for a time. Well, there is one seat in the Holy of Holies. It's the mercy seat. It's the place where God sits, right? And God doesn't meet us upon the law. Why? The law condemns us. We would face his judgment because we can't keep the law. Where does he meet us? Oh, the mercy seat. Isn't that amazing? Paul in Galatians 2.16 said, Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. You see that? You know, people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. It doesn't matter. By the works of the law, no flesh We'll be justified. We're justified in Christ. It can't save us. What does the law do? What is the purpose of the law then? It points us to Jesus. It points us to our Savior. Because we know we can't do it. We fall far short of attaining a righteousness that God requires, and that's perfection. Galatians 3, verses 10 and 11, Paul said, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. I, I'm always amazed at people who want to live by the law. You know, there was the Hebrew Roots movement and all that, and there's other movements where they want to live by the law. Have you read the book of Leviticus? Are you kidding me? That's just the book of Leviticus. There's 613 commandments. I had, I had this water jug the other day that I was uh, filling up with water. I was um, wastewater that I was uh, um, using for my fish tank. I have to make special water for the fish. They're special fish. 
Um, and so I figured I'm not going to just waste this water. I'm going to save it. So I was putting it in these five-gallon jugs. And I'm done with it, and I'm going out to the garage, and I'm looking for the cap. I can't find the cap. I'm like, man, Julie called when I was doing all this. You know, I've got to blame Julie. She's not here. And, you know, I had, she told me to go check for some yarn. Wow. Yeah, that... I thought maybe it fell out of my pocket, so I'm looking everywhere. I'm looking behind the washer, the dryer, where my whole filtration system is. I'm looking everywhere. I can't find it. I probably spent 20 minutes or half an hour looking for this thing. I finally just said, you know what, I'm putting some tape around the top of it, and I'm done. And so then I'm walking through the kitchen out of the garage, and I'm thinking, hey, there's my jacket. I bet I put it in the pocket of my jacket, and there it was. How am I going to remember 613 laws? I can't even find the cap for the jug that I filled. I am, you know, I'm working, studying Leviticus, as that'll the next, be the next book after Exodus on Thursday. And all I can say is, thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Because to do all those things, wow. You know, hear this picture of what this mercy seat is and these angels on either side of the mercy seat. Look at what it looks like there. And this is what Mary saw. I know you're thinking, oh, where do you get that from? John tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. He said, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Again, like I said, God requires perfection from us. But again, we know we're not perfect. We, but we've been adopted in the family of God through faith in Christ. And so in a positional sense, we are perfect. Because the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all our sins. Positionally, practically day to day, we still struggle with sin. So now the Father looks upon us through the blood of Christ and we're as white as snow. And again, practically speaking, when we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, a defense attorney, Jesus Christ. The word advocate in the Greek is parakletos, one who speaks in our defense. Oh, it's use of the Holy Spirit as well. Now, again, I'm not picking on defense attorneys, but when I think of a defense attorney, sometimes they manipulate the truth to get their client free. If Jesus did that, he would be unrighteous, right? So how does Jesus defend us? How does he refute the accusations that Satan brings against us? Because they're true. Because our advocate has become our propitiation or atonement for our sins. That's how. God became sin for us. He paid in full the penalty for our sins. He endured the wrath that was due us. So he doesn't only defend us, but he pays the penalty for our sins. He doesn't have to manipulate the evidence because he took care of it. It was paid in full by him. Case closed. Now, here's the interesting part. When they were translating the Hebrew scriptures of the Old Testament into Greek, somewhere around 250 B.C. or so, the Greek word they used for mercy seat is the same Greek word that John uses for propitiation, halasmos. In other words, on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest entered the Holy of Holies and poured the blood upon the mercy seat to atone for the sins of the nation, John is saying Jesus has become our mercy seat, and it's his blood that was shed to atone completely for our sins. What was inside the Ark of the Covenant? The law of God. What sits on top of that? The mercy seat, right? And what is sprinkled upon the mercy seat is the blood. So the blood covers the law as Jesus paid in full for our sins. He became our mercy seat. 
Paul in Hebrews 7.25 said, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Oh, I love that. In fact, the word propitiation, again, Alfred says, the word implies that Christ has, as our sin offering, reconciled God and us by nothing else but by his voluntary death as a sacrifice, has by this averted God's wrath from us. Absolutely. He took our sins, the wrath that was going to be poured out upon us, upon himself. You see, as you, you start looking at this, you go, it, it just breaks your heart what God had to do because of what we have done. But that's the whole reason. Sin separated man from God. Jesus came to reconcile us, to bring us back together. He's the mediator or the bridge builder. The bridge was out. And now God has become our bridge builder that brings us to the Father. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. Why? Why? That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. That's the reason. Sin separated us from God. Jesus came to reconcile us back to the Father. There's no longer a barrier if you've come to Christ. And again, where does God meet us? On the mercy seat. It covers the law. And as these two angels look down, they don't see the law, but they see the mercy seat covered with the blood of the sacrifice. Because the blood was between the law and God, between the law and God's judgment. But look at what God has done for us. Clark put it like this. He said, here we learn that God designed to give the most evident display of both his justice and mercy, of his justice in requiring a sacrifice, and absolutely refusing to give the salvation to a lost world in any other way, and of his mercy in the providing the sacrifice which his justice required. Wow. There is no other way. As Peter said, there is no other name given on, among men or given us under heaven. There is no other name given by God for which we must be saved. No other name. Jesus is our mercy seat. Now, I have to mention this, because this is interesting. Mary is carrying on a conversation with two angels. She's not moved. She's not comforted. She's still just, I'm sure, weeping. They stole his body. Where is he? You know, Jesus only can fill that void in our heart. And these angels, as great as they were, couldn't do that. Only Jesus can. Proverbs 8, 17, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Let me ask you this. Do you think Mary will find the Lord? Absolutely she will. Why? Because my sheep hear my voice. Look at verse 13 here in John 20. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. So here these two angels ask Mary, Why are you crying? And her response is, you could just feel her heart just breaking. They have stolen away my Lord. And I don't know where they have laid him. Man, talk about love. She just wanted to properly bury Jesus, the one she loved, and now they stole his body. At least that's what she thought. And I think it was at this point that these two angels, I think at first they looked beyond Mary. And I was praying about this this morning. I was going over my notes. I thought, you know what? The Lord is before them. What do you think those angels are going to do? Well, they're going to bow before him. And I think that's exactly what happened. I think these angels are now bowing down. And, you know, Mary was looking at them. 
And it says all of a sudden she turned around. Said, what are they looking at? Why are they kneeling? Right? <laughs> and she sees this, per this man standing that doesn't know who it is. It's a gardener. Why didn't she recognize Jesus? There's a lot of reasons. Some say that, you know, he, he appeared differently. Well, I think he did. Uh, some say it was dark outside. Others say it was the tears in her eyes. But remember, he still bears the marks of the crucifixion. And how does that look? I, I don't, don't know how that's going to look. It's not going to be pretty. We know he's got the nail marks in his hands, his feet, spear hole in his side, the crown of thorns. The th marks are still there. In fact, Isaiah 52, 14 says, Just as many were astonished at you, so his vis visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Yeah, they're going to be amazed at how he's going to look. He's going to bear the marks of the crucifixion. Revelation 5, 6, And I looked, John was looking, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits sent out into all the earth. Maybe that's the reason Mary couldn't recognize him. In fact, I think Jesus is the only one who will be or have a deformity or wounds in heaven. I think we'll all be, you know, perfect in heaven. You'll all be five, six like me. Perfect. Sorry, <laughs> had to throw that in there. But think about it. For eternity, our Lord is going to bear those marks, showing how much he loved us, what he was willing to do for us. We think, you know, boy, when we get to heaven, that's going to be hard. It should be hard for us now. And for Mary, man, just the devotion of this woman, man, what did they do? The gardener, if you took them, let me know. I just want them back, and I'll take them away. Do you ever think about that? I don't know how big Mary was, but Jesus was probably at least average, right? How was she going to carry him? That's how much love. It didn't matter. I'll do whatever it takes. Just give me his body, and I will take him away. What devotion. What devotion. And Jesus, think about all Jesus could say to Mary, right? What does he say? One word, Mary. Isn't that interesting? All of a sudden, he says, Mary, boom! Boom! She knows it's Jesus, right? She grabs him and is never going to let go. She's got a death grip on him now. She thought he was the gardener a minute ago. And Jesus didn't reveal himself to Mary, going, Mary, it's me, Jesus. What's wrong with you? He just said, Mary. He called her by that name. She heard it many times from his lips. But now, imagine hearing that voice. You know, it, it's like in a crowd. You can pick out your kids, right? <laughs> Everyone's yelling, oh, there's my son right over there. Yep, he's the one. Mary knew the voice of Jesus. Her eyes didn't see. Her ears, though, knew exactly what, who that voice was from. We have to be careful. There's a lot of voices out there that are claiming to be voices of Jesus. But there's only one voice of Jesus, right? Like Jesus said in John 10, my sheep, or the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. Why? For they know his voice. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You know, the stories of, of shepherds in, in Israel, and, you know, the one shepherd, and there's all these sheep, and there may be another shepherd, and there's a bunch of sheep, and they may be mingling together for a time, and then it's time for one of the shepherds to go. 
and he calls out to his sheep, and you know what? All his sheep follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. Now, the other shepherd could try and call them. They won't listen. Why? Because they know the shepherd's voice. That was Mary. She knew her shepherd's voice. And again, she has a death grip on Jesus, not going to let him go. And Jesus says, you know what? Don't grip me this way. You got to let me go. Why? It's interesting because Jesus permitted the other woman to hold his feet. He didn't forbid them. So what's going on? Well, in the, the Greek, the, the, this phrase here means to stop an action already begun rather to, than to avoid starting it. Mary was never going to let him go. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like your kids. You, you know, when my kids were young, dropping them off in Sunday school, you know, they have a death grip on you. They are never going to let you go. You know, you're walking and they're on your leg and you're dragging them along, right? That was Mary. She had such a death grip on Jesus. So he wasn't protesting that Mary shouldn't touch him, but you got to let me go. And she doesn't have to fear because she's going to see him again. But again, how important it is to know our shepherd's voice, isn't it? You know, I, I do like you know, the internet, and I do appreciate social media, media because you can get a lot of information out there about the Lord. But you can also get a lot of disinformation out, out. And that's what we see today. How do we know what is real and what is not? Got to know the voice of our Lord. And it's got to be according to the word of God, doesn't it? You know, I, I love people that come up to me. Oh, you got you to gotta hear this. This is something new. No one's ever seen this before. You mean to tell me all throughout church history, almost 2,000 years, no one has ever seen this before, but you are the first one to see it. Are you kidding me? And it's usually not in according to God's word. In fact, Jesus gives us a warning in Matthew 7, verses 13 through 20. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Use discernment. I just, again, there was a worship conference meeting. Laura Dangle is a musician. And it, just speaking about how wonderful worship was. And here at this worship sit, service, again, she's not against homosexuality, transgenderism, where all these people, gay, lesbian, transgender, all dressed, praising God. Really? That's worship. It's not. We got to f- understand that it's only by the word of God. If people are doing things that are contrary to the word of God, we don't follow them. I'm sorry. That may seem kind of cold and harsh. Now, would, would I let someone who is gay or transgender into the church? Absolutely. But if they told me they were a Christian, I would have to talk with them. Because that's inconsistent with what the word of God says. I'll let anyone into the church. You know, with the bar next door, we had Thursday evenings. I remember, it's several years ago now. And Georgia was sitting in the second row where Mary's at. And someone who was drunk, it was cold, really cold outside, came in and sat down next to Georgia. He was quiet, he wasn't interrupting, and hey, I'm just teaching. So as long as you're quiet, you can stay there. 
And then before long, his head went down on Georgia's shoulder, <laughs> and he fell asleep. And poor Georgia, you know, I'm looking at her, you know, and I'm, it's kind of funny what I see here. Um, but she was very kind and just allowed him. And we tried to reach out in the love of Christ to him. That's what the church is about. You know, we don't close the doors to people. But if someone claims to be a Christian and they're living in continual sin, you got to deal with it. You can't let it go on. That means you don't love them if you let them continue in it. So we know our shepherd's voice. We know what he's telling us, and then we have to obey. And, you know, this Broadway today, it's leading people to hell. And they're comfortable because they've been told lies. But we have the truth, and we speak it forth in love. And we have to know the voice of our Lord. Because there are so many voices out there today, isn't there? So many voices calling us to do this, do that. But there's one voice we listen to, our shepherd, and following him all the days of our life. My sheep hear my voice. Absolutely. Now, as we finish up this morning, we're going to look at go and tell in verse 18 of John 20. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. So she goes and tells that he has risen. That's the message. Mark, Mark gives us some insight in Mark 16, verses 9 through 11 of what Mary did. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they jumped for joy and were so excited. Oh, no, it says they did not believe. You know, it's kind of funny when you read that, right? Didn't, what did Jesus say? I'm going to be crucified, and on the third day I'm going to rise again. He told them several times that. Mary comes and says, I've seen the risen Lord. <sighs> what a nut job. He's probably been out in the sun till. She's a woman. I mean, what do you expect? She's very emotional. Who knows what she saw? Not a, no excitement at all. And again, women were looked down upon in that period of time. But who's the first person that Jesus appeared to? Mary. <laughs> and then the other women, right? So Jesus trusts them. But the rabbis, they taught it is better that the words of the law be burned than to entrust it to a woman. Wow. Don't let them handle that stuff. Can't trust them. Wow. But Mary saw the risen Lord, and she's going to tell the grave is empty. Come and see. And here, two th some, almost 2,000 years post-resurrection, it not that what people still need to hear? Jesus Christ, crucified, rose from the grave the third day. Absolutely. This world is a mess. But he's coming back to right the wrongs that have been done. And I, I think about it. These guys are emotional, they have no hope. All they poured, out in, poured their lives into for almost three and a half years is taken away. And they didn't believe yet that he is risen. Is there hopelessness in the world today? Yeah. You know, we see it with children, teenagers, young adults, middle-aged adults, older adults. The rise in hopelessness. Why? Because we've taken the source of hope away. The Lord. What are you putting your hope in? You see, we put it in all kinds of things and then we're disappointed. Oh, I got this political person and then they disappoint you. Or this or that, whatever. People are going to disappoint you. The Lord will not. 62% of adults um, disagreed with this statement. Our children are going to be are going to inherit a better world than we did. 63% disagreed with the statement, I feel our country is on the path to being stronger than ever. That's hopelessness. Now again, I don't put my faith in the country or in people, I put my faith in the Lord. 
because I know he's in control. 76% of adults said the future of our nation is a significant source of stress in their lives, and 68% said this is the lowest point in our nation's history that they can remember. What is that saying? It's hopelessness. Here's the cure, the remedy for this hopelessness, and that's Jesus Christ. You know, come on. Absolutely. There is not a doubt in my mind because apart from him, there is no hope. I mean, really, are you putting your hope in death? Because if you don't believe in the Lord, what do you have? You know, I know people that don't believe in God, reject him. So this is all there is to life. 60, 70, 80, 90 years. That's it. And then when you're gone, done with. Man, that's depressing. Especially as you get older, right? You know, when I, when I was a kid, teenager, I thought 30 was ancient. I'm kind of looking at 90 being ancient now, maybe. I don't know, maybe push it to 100, I don't know. Why? Because I'm a lot older now. Life is short. And I know because he is risen, one day I too will rise from the grave. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's my hope. And apart from that, I have nothing. Because he defeated death, so too will I. And again, I'm not saying I'm not going to die unless the rapture happens first. But I'm going to be with the Lord. He defeated death on the cross of Calvary for us. D.L. Moody, as a young man, was called upon to preach a funeral sermon. And he hunted through all four Gospels trying to find one of Christ's funeral sermons. But he didn't find anything. He searched in vain. He found that Christ broke up every funeral funeral he ever attended. Death could not exist where he was. When the dead heard his voice, they sprang to life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Absolutely. This is the good news that we bring to people. Yes, we are dead in our trespasses and sins, but if we repent of our sins and ask Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of our lives, we shall be saved. Jesus, God became flesh, dwelt among us, went to the cross of Calvary, was crucified, and rose the third day. It's the gospel message. Remember as we started, the sign um, outside the, the garden tomb there in Jerusalem, he's not here for he is risen. And I'll leave you with this to think about. The tomb is empty, won't you come and see? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that he, Jesus has rose and risen from the grave. The death had no power over him. And he f went to the cross for our sins. The love of God for sinful man is incredible. And this is the good news we bring to people. It's not something that should, we, we should ever be ashamed to share. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation to all who believe. Absolutely. Give us that power, Lord, to proclaim your truths. We love you. I pray for every heart here, those of us on the radio, the internet. Lord, may we see you more clearly each and every day as we study your word. And you, by your spirit, you open up yourself to us. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.